Church. So at the request of Alicia, uh, <laughs> uh, we are going to talk about, let me share my screen, um, asset management of loans. And got, like I said, a lot I'm going to cover tonight. Again, feel free for people to ask questions, put it in chat, make it very open. I'll probably ask a few people who do things a certain way, maybe share a little bit. Jeff, I know I talked to you previously, If share a little bit about how you use ClickUp as an example. Uh, I'm not going to go... I'm not going to go too deep into uh, a lot of the systems. I'll talk about them and I'll share a few things that I find helpful. Uh, but I'm also going to talk a lot about the time suck in this business. And I'll probably pick on Sandra a little bit on this because she's going to be very familiar with a lot of these things, including a lot of the things that probably take a lot of her time when she's chasing me for things. And uh, from just different aspects. So let's see here. Um, and this is also just FYI, I took this from a presentation I did, some of this from a presentation I did a while ago. Uh, one of the things just as we talk about uh, your management, it's, you know, the first thing you got to decide is what are you doing in-house first? What are you doing outsourcing? Uh, for me, my bidding, due diligence, and loan management, I do all of that in-house. I do not outsource um, any of that. Uh, I Any bid that I put numbers on, I make sure I am looking at. Uh, you know, whether it's me, a staff member or, uh, whoever it is, um, we are, you know, looking at that, uh, outsourcing, of course, loan servicing. I think I saw Shante on here. I don't hear her, but, um, uh, I think she's around. Uh, so that's one area, the collateral recording and storage, of course, uh, another area to outsource because I've gone back and forth many times on that and it's been painful. Uh, bookkeeping uh, is something that we all are probably feeling, you know, the wrath of over the last month of trying to get books done. I don't know how many people have gotten all their K-1s. I am still trying to get mine as well as get mine out the door. It's been uh, very painful. Uh, REO disposition. This is one of the time sucks that we'll talk about uh, in using an asset management company versus trying to find a local realtor. Uh, that is just a uh, royal pain, which we'll talk about. Uh, and then like some marketing, social media stuff. Uh, you know, you can find people much more economical for yourself. Uh, this is, I'll open this topic up for a lot of people as well to kind of just get a sense for what people are using. Uh, you know, most of us, I think, use the Microsoft Office suite. You know, there's the Outlook versus Gmail debate. One is not better than the other. It's really much suitable. Uh, I'd say, you know, the older you are, you know, you probably lean more towards Outlook. The younger you are, you probably lean more towards Gmail. Uh, task list and task management is probably the most important area. Uh, if, you know, Gmail, G Suite uh, has Yenadu, which was something I used to use in the past. Um, there's Asana, there's Podio, there's To Do. Uh, there's so many different aspects and I'll share a little bit of when you start scaling, how to organize certain things, uh, by using hashtags, for example, in these, uh, I hashtag, uh, my loans, uh, with attorneys. So if I'm on the phone with an attorney, for example, uh, Jillian Snyder, who I use in Pennsylvania, now my hashtag Jillian. And then if she calls me, I can just, when I'm in to do, click on the button and we'll be talking about one asset. I can look at the other five or 10 I have in foreclosure and quickly, and I'll share some of that with you. Uh, then your loan management system. You know, I use mortgage office, but that's really expensive. Uh, you could use Podio, Pipedrive, ClickUp uh, is systems that people use. Uh, and there's others. Some people just use Excel as you're getting started. Uh, I'm going to talk about later on, what are the key things that you want to track? So right now I'm starting at higher level and we're going to dig into the weeds. So don't feel like um, I'm skipping over everything. I'm kind of setting the tone of, you know, there's a lot of stuff that people are going to use. Uh, and is, you know, there's unfortunately not really one all in one solution that I'm aware of uh, at this point in time, but there's a lot of things. And like I said, we'll start the high level and we're gonna start digging deep into this stuff. Uh, Keep is what I use for CRM. Uh, UMA, I use for Office. One of the great things about UMA is you can record phone calls. 
Uh, you can set it so all the calls get recorded. So if a borrower does call you and you're having a conversation with them and you tell them, yes, I need to have payments by the 30th of April and one by May 31st and this amount. And if you're late, then, you know, we're going to proceed. And then when they sit there later on, say, that's not what I was told, you can pull out the recording and say, you know, here's the recording. Uh, so, so Chris, when you record on UMA, does it warn them that, yep. or, or do you have a warning because they're single versus two party consent yep. statements, right? Yep. So before it actually goes to me, I have a automatic, it's like, if you call an attorney, you know, when it says, thank you for reaching Satilian Burley, please note this firm is a debt collector. Anything you say can it be used to collect the debt, blah, blah, blah. I have that mini Miranda and I say this call will be recorded um, for quality assurance purposes, <laughs> um, you know, kind of, you know, or whatever. Uh, but no, I actually had, uh, I have that recording. So no matter who calls, they get that before they get me. So that way you don't have to worry about, oh, did I read this person the Miranda or whatever the case may be. Uh, you know, QuickBooks uh, used for accounting, uh, PNC Pinnacle, I'm actually switching banks because PNC booted me um, because they must think I'm a bad person. Uh, Bluebeam is what I use for PDFs. It's that's actually like construction software for a lot of people who may be familiar with it. But uh, interesting story with Bluebeam. I was working on a project doing uh, a, an Adobe headquarter building just outside of Boston. And they wanted the entire job to be paperless. And we we're actually using Bluebeam, not Adobe software, because their software sucked at the time. So they got pissed um, at their own people, not at us, uh, because we were using someone else's software. And of course, that's what Adobe's known for is PDFs. Uh, my Remarkable 2 tablet, uh, again, is something that I use to take notes, which unfortunately my son has right now because he uses it for drawing maps. Uh, Zoom, of course. Uh, and again, the other thing too, with all these are money. So when you start looking at things, you know, try and find stuff that's free. Like if you use Microsoft, maybe use Teams or get a free Zoom account. Uh, Simplifile. If anyone, if you do your own recording, you definitely want to get Simplifile. And of course, everyone knows about Data Tree, which we can talk about. Uh, let's see. And again, um, you know, when you get started, you want to build a foundation, which is put your plan together. And as you map out your time that you're going to be spending on managing your assets, leave time for the contingency period, you know, don't overbook yourself. Uh, and of course, you know, I like to say work on your business, not in your business from what is it for our work week or whichever book it was uh, from there. But it's very important to really structure and plan out your time, but definitely don't overbook. Uh, for example, you know, I have, again, 250 assets, and I'll share with you kind of how I go through all of those um, and manage those over the course of, um, you know, a month's time and so forth. Uh, you know, and this is my daily routine, usually about 90 minutes in the morning. Um, I will do my morning review of my loans, uh, my inbox zero, and basically I call it my task tag and conquer. So one of the things I'll share right now, actually. So like in mortgage office, um, uh, can you, uh, hold on, let me make sure. Do you see uh, my loans now? Okay, so I have it broken down by like first Monday, first Tuesday, first Wednesday. So basically I just go through these and they basically get me through basically about the first two plus weeks. So on Tuesday, I have 19 loans, Thursday I have 16. Monday, 32, Tuesday, you know, it's only two on that day, um, but it breaks out the number of loans per day. And I just, you know, again, like everyone always says, how do you eat that elephant is by, you know, breaking things down into smaller tasks. So I'll take my loans and I'll break them down. Yes, buddy. Um, it's, I give it back to you what? as a gift. I can use it. You can use it again. What? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um so, but, okay okay let can daddy do his webinar please All right. thank you um <laughs> how do you decide which loans you look at each day uh great question uh because i have them in multiple funds uh i will typically do that but usually by servicer because i try you know when i was using Wi-Fi, Ally, Madison, you know, that's three different logins. And with Madison, I'd have to log in to each different account. They weren't linked. Allied, I struck a deal with them where everything was under one. So that wasn't too bad. 
and then by five, I'm able to, you know, get mine linked there as well. So it's, you know, instead of jumping around, that's kind of how I structured them was based off of fund and off of, uh, you know, where they're being serviced. I do try and also, you know, and typically most of my funds, again, have like 30, 70 splits of performing versus non-performing. Usually Mondays, I try and have those Mondays and Fridays be like the light load loans, you know, mostly performing ones you're just checking in on because your energy level typically on a Monday or Friday's a little less. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays are kind of like, ah, oh, shit, you know, here are the ones I got to really dive into or dig into. Um, and then, you know, for my inbox zero uh, type, so let me just pull this over. Can you see my inbox? Okay. So like, you know, again, this is everything in my inbox is it, you know, from 9am this morning, I break things down into um, my accounting input into TMO or input, you know, those comments or notes into my software invoices paid, send the servicer invoices sent to servicer that, you know, I basically still need to hit the button to pay and then open open is basically after I've done something with it. I just dump everything in there. Accounting is all the bills I need to pay. Um, and then basically I'll go through all of these and hopefully nobody sent me up. Yeah, Shante sent me emails. Um, but what I'll do is basically like say this one, what's nice about to do is when you click on the little link here, like here's one from Jamie about some Heckam loans working at, I can drop that in there and it automatically puts it into to do. So it will show up in here, which is, this is to do. So if you use office 365 and then I break things down by ball in court, waiting for reply, my legal. Um, podcast marketing, things that are down the road, not urgent, um, go abundance, which I recently joined things to do there. Um, and on my legal, I do loan number, address, last name, attorney. So if I'm on the phone with somebody from Satilian Barilli, I can click on it. And options, I completed. Here are all my loans that I've got Satili working on. So I can quickly click on one of these. It has the email. I can open the email. I can add notes. Um, so from an email management system, it's very, so most of what I use TMO for is more historical database where between my mail and um, to do, or some people sauna, whatever you use, this is more kind of live in regards to where, you know, I'm back and forth checking into things. What does TMO stand for again? The mortgage office. Okay. So that's, I mean, I've got it from, you know, when I was, you know, starting my funds, it was, you know, it's the same software that a lot of services use. Madison uses it. BiFi uses it. Uh, Lake city servicing uses it. FCI, uh, you know, created their own version of it. Um, but I found, you know, and what's nice about this software is you can put things, you know, by due dates. So you can go to your plans and then see, okay, I'm 21 behind, 11, tomorrow only have two items. Um, then I've got 60 kind of down the road. And then as you organize everything, you can just go through each day and be like, okay, here are the things that I have to have to knock off, essentially. So Chris, did you say to do links with Outlook? Yeah, it's part of, oh, okay. um, yeah. So it's basically part of, it's their new task management system. Okay. And then, so then when you go to the task, the, the email pops up. Yep. So that one I mentioned, the Heckam loan one yep. is right here and I can just open it in Outlook and okay. then it goes back and we'll open it right back. You can Outlook. see what it says. Mm -hmm. If you move it, sometimes it may give you like a, you know, an error message. So usually I move it, then put it in um, if I'm going to move it. But yeah, and that's Good. kind of. Chris, when you say FCI created their own version of TMO, is TMO customizable like Podio is? Or uh, yes, to uh, well, you can cr do a lot with TMO in regards to like one of the things I put in TMO is the last pay date uh, as a field. Actually, let me hold on. Let me pop TMO back up. So, like, I put entity here. So I know which entity it's in because I run multiple entities. Another one I added is the last pay date that I added this. 
Um, because it's so I know because I have loans that might be like Phyllis Flurry. You know, her next due date is 6116, but she actually last paid on 12921. She's been paying a little bit here and there Love because it. you may have loans that might be, you know, two years behind, but they might have been paying for like a year. Um, and mm -hmm. basically, I know Shante's been as part of BiFi doing a lot of the customization for, um, on the servicing side with investors in regards to forced place insurance, taxes, uh, and a lot of other things that I've tracked in the past where I put in there like delinquent taxes and some other components that now Shante is actually kind of doing that with BiFi. Um, but it can be done in TMO. I mean, it's in TMO. Uh, so you can add a lot of custom fields to it. The mortgage office, the one thing that about it is it's not from an automation standpoint, it's not like an automation where if there's certain things that are, you know, something's behind uh, that you can have it generate a task or kick something off. Got it. Okay. What do other people use? Uh, curiosity, Eric. And so you're saying, what do you, what are you using for your notes? I've used pipe drive since the beginning, and I originally did it because I wanted to integrate emails into it, but then I stopped using that feature, and basically right now I'm paying for a calendar. Um, I organize all my loans based on borrower last name, mm -hmm. so I could just like look them up based on that, but it's essentially just like a calendar of like tasks that I need to do for every single loan. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody gave me some advice a while back, um, and he said, be careful with um, using software that isn't supported by a company, because if it's not, and it like goes under and you have your entire business in that software, you know, you have a problem. But I mean, Pipedrive is not really, I mean, it's like a sales CRM. It's not really yeah. designed for, mm -hmm. I mean, what we're using it for. And it has some cool features. I mean, you can send out like mass emails, but mm -hmm. I, I've looked at some other stuff. I haven't really found anything that I thought worked better. I mean, the other issue is that like, once you mm -hmm. put all of this information in, it's such a pain to get it out for hundreds and hundreds of loans. I mean, it's almost like, I mean, you almost would have to like slowly integrate it into a new system. So, yeah. I, so I used pipe drive at one point in time. You are hundred percent correct. I've used two different systems that were like one-off creations. And then the people find something better to do. You're screwed because everything is there. Um, Jeff, I'm going to ask you in a minute to show your click up because the way you've done it is pretty impressive. Uh, before I have Jeff hop on. So your file system and how you fold a file. And I've gone through this once before is very important. Um, you know, I have a due diligence phase, which I just dump my due diligence documents in there, but for asset management phase, you know, I break things down kind of in, you know, nine or 10 buckets of you get collateral storage, which is, you know, the assignments, the launches, uh, you know, you're servicing um, and under servicing, you know, I'll usually put uh, if, you know, payoffs or reinstatements or anything that I've gotten from the servicer. Legal is demand letters, uh, complaints, uh, you know, those types of things. If you're in any type of joint venture partnership or anything or partial on that asset or whatever the case may be, I dump that there. Financial statement. Uh, again, if I have a partner on that deal, I send them a quarterly report. I also drop it in there and I actually give them access to this folder so they can just log in at any time. Property preservation, which you hope that it stays empty, but unfortunately that's never the case. Uh, so that's where you know my preservation reports, if I've changed locks, cut grass, everything goes there. Insurance, you know, force place insurance, the letters that you, you that may go out to the borrower. Um, and then what I'll do is if I do have force place insurance, I also drop a copy of the declaration from the company like JB Lloyd. I'll download that so I know how much, you know, it's insured for, which I also, again, put that information in TMO, but it's also good to have. Tax bills, uh, you know, certain servicers, you know, you have to send them the tax bills. Um, you know, again, I don't like saying negative things about servicers, but the ones that I have to go chase my own tax bills drives me freaking nuts. 
And then uh, REO disposition. If it is an REO, you're taking it over. Uh, you know, are you doing rehab to it? What are you doing to the property? Uh, offers that you may receive uh, from that perspective. So typically if I have invoicing, um, you know, and stuff, I usually don't file invoices by the asset. I usually do file that uh, as in an accounting folder by month uh, that gets dropped in uh, with all my books. Uh, Jeff, do you want to, I'm going to let Jeff share because Jeff has created, um, so are people familiar with ClickUp? Uh, so ClickUp is, oh, what was that other one like Excel base that was really cool for, and then ClickUp just kind of um, Airtable. So if anyone's Airtable. ever actually, everyone heard of Airtable, Airtable is like an online Excel on steroids. And then ClickUp basically came out and um, it's a new software. And Jeff, do you want to, I'll let you share your screen. And Yeah. So basically what ClickUp did is they're trying to go after a bunch of different software packages at once. So I started out looking at like all the different software packages and um, I stumbled upon ClickUp by mistake. So just let me um, show something really quick to kind of uh, set the stage for this. And uh, can you guys see my screen? Yep. So basically, it's funny because I'm by nature an inbox zero guy, and maybe it's a project management thing. And uh, so I was like that at work until five years of my um, archives got erased, and I think it broke my spirit. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, but basically, so step one, email arrives. I'm just showing this first, so you get an idea of how the flow works for me goes into my inbox and then for me like I think most inbox zero people are it's kind of like every email is a potential action so step two I save any attachments to the cloud drive and then I always save the attachments to try to tell me as much as what's in the attachments as possible so ideally I can just look at them and not have to open them like okay what's the date what's the property what's the subject attorney fee title how much is that so it's three hundred dollars decimal point zero and then what's the invoice number and is it initially recoverable rcvr or not recoverable right because and then and then I replicate my file structure in Outlook. I don't like put things into folders like in the drive. I immediately just hand sort them into archive email folders that replicate my ClickUp drive. And then I forward, and this is actually the key step is step number three. I forward the email with attachments into ClickUp. And I can forward, the beautiful thing about this is let's say I get an email from Brock and Scott like legal about 3021 Melrose Avenue, I can forward the email both to that property in ClickUp and to the general Brock and Scott ledger. So I can get like a real time of all the discussions I've had in Brock and Scott, uh, Scott and then a specific uh, one. And then I can also, if it's a bill, forward it to um, my 2022 receipts, right? So that's generally how I organize everything. You're making me so, look bad, by the way. By not what's doing that? It. I said you're making me look bad by not doing all that stuff, but that's okay. Oh, no, it's just, <laughs> well, I have far fewer loans than you, right? So mm -hmm. every individual loan probably means more to me. So as kind mm -hmm. of an example, oh, this is my hot mail. <laughs> that's not good. Um, so I don't, so like let's say Sabran Grochi. So here's, uh, this is the 3021 uh, vacant property that's like killing me in property preservation fees, right? Mm -hmm. So what I would do here is I would forward it and I would say, and this is kind of something, I'm showing you this for a reason. So I have a group email address and I'll show you why that is 3021. So I gave it its own ClickUp address. And then let's say this is from Brock and Scott, so I also have a Brock and Scott group email thing too. And then I just hit send, right? And so now going to ClickUp, uh, but before I go to ClickUp, I'll show you something. So, so I don't bother with um, Excel folders that aren't ar archived. Uh, so this is the HDRS. So I create an email archive that just goes to, that gets archived in my OneDrive. And I, as after I send it, I just sort it. And I try to minimize subfolders by having, and this will make more sense in a second, all capitalized is a space 
And then this first subfolder that's capitalized is um, a folder, and then it's a list after that. And you'll see why that is in a second. You can tell people who've worked for or with the government <laughs> because of their their folder systems and everything is yeah yeah you know they, yeah. they have they literally have books um, of like you know when we were building a building for the government like you know how to follow everything. Which the interesting thing is all the government projects that you build are supposed to be done in the metric system, but then you have to get a waiver or variance because none of the contracts actors actually can read or follow the metric system so right right but. and and so like what i always try to do is make things that catch the eye because mm. i want sorting data to be my happy place like just drinking coffee and just like automatic like neo mm. dodging the bullets right um so i chose to bring this up first it's a fun feature of ClickUp. it has a map feature so I can take all the properties I have and just plot them on the map. So, it's kind of like a goal setting thing. Jeff, right? Jeff, before one quick question, how much is ClickUp? Uh, it's super cheap. I think it's like less than twenty dollars a month for this. Okay. So when and people, it's agile, yeah. it's agile software too. So if you want a feature, you can just email it to them, and then they'll put it in this thing, and people will vote on it, and then they'll just update the software constantly. It's mm -hmm. all cloud based. Um, it's, it's really cool. So, so what you would see if you went back to my email is this folder structure is completely replicated in the archives in my Outlook structure. So here in notes, so the way um, ClickUp is organized is spaces, which I think of as being like the different business functions. So I have the individual notes, and then I have note records, which is the um, emails related to the notes. And then I have the different organizations potentially within when I'm running like finance, legal, government operations. And this down here, the black section is more like stuff learning, right? It's not directly related um, to the business function, right? So for the notes, so this is a space level and then the folder level, and then the list level. So if you're familiar with Microsoft Project, the list is kind of where I think of Microsoft Project, right? So if I want to click on this, what I did initially, this is a Gantt chart that rolls up automatically. So if you're not familiar with Gantt chart, it's a time phase chart um, where all your tasks are linked, right? Um, so what I did is I took Chris's due diligence process and I put it into ClickUp. So as I complete it, I set everything to a done status within, so pre-review bid to bid. I took Chris's um, due diligence sheets and I just check off everything as I go through and then post bid due diligence to capture. I just go through and I check that off and I change the status. Right. And then to asset management. And then as things happen in post capture asset management, I add it in as a new task. Right. So what you can do is, and this is um, where your bills from your attorney are gold. And Brock and Scott will not only tell you if things are recoverable, but they'll tell you the date on which something happened. So then you can go in and you can recreate the series of events. One thing I always like to do in project management is set up systems that tell me the structure of things. That So what it is that I enter this and over time I can see like, okay, here's service via publication. It had to happen for three weeks. And then you see what happens after that, right? So over a period of time, you do enough of these and it'll tell you like, okay, so they notice the final judicial report filed, motion for default judgment, and then they had to put an affidavit in support of judgment. And then they filed the judgment entry. And then they had the order of sale, right? And the beautiful thing click up is I can just change the scale of this to look, or I can, or I can export this view to a PDF and um, I'll be able to like download it. So in, in Ohio, if you had 10 of these, you could basically see, check the historical data. So you'd have a better idea of how long it's taking to foreclose in Ohio. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So the beauty of this is everything that is in a space can be 
um, rolled up to a higher level, right? So what I did at the notes level is you can go to the board view, right? And this is and, what pipe drive looked like for a lot of people who use pipe right. drive in the past. It's very similar. Exactly. And so what I did is I created statuses based on, uh, you know, Chris had directed me to some videos and I saw they had this view. So I just recreated the statuses, right? So pre-bid to review. And so here are my loans right now, my massive five remaining loan portfolio, right? So I have one performing and four in foreclosure. So ClickUp has this weird thing where um, it only lets you do certain number of levels of subtasks. So what I do is um, when I complete like a whole section, I just send it to complete it and then I collapse this column and it, it only shows what's actually in play for these parts. So you can see the, the property address, right? And then, um, and then what you can do is in each level, you can create a view and have it go into the data and look and extract things, right? And so I created views of, um, so I have property status. So this is another view instead of board view, it shows where my loans currently are. And then I have loan info. And so it goes through all the, um, all the properties that are in here for each state. So each folder is a different state. And here's another interesting thing you can do is you can create tags as you're going through things to highlight things that you want to do. And here's all the loan info. And here's the asset information, like number of beds and baths. And, um, and then cost and overview, right? So this is kind of like profit and loss. Right. And this is kind of something when I was talking to Chad, he was showing me that he did. And so that's kind of another interesting thing. And um, let's see. Can you show so, Sandra that I, you made money on that asset you bought from me just so she can tell Jamie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is percent profit. I don't I can't get the percentage. So right. that one asset I bought from you, I had a 44 percent profit on it. All right. Sandra, so, about Jamie now. <laughs> yeah. So, but one thing I have not shown you yet, and this is the, the key thing, is the um, list view. So the Gantt chart can be automatically construct. It's actually automatically constructed from the list view. And here is, um, I took Chris's due diligence sheets and I just put it all in here. And this is really like an eyeful because, and, and it's too long of an explanation to go why I constructed it in so many columns. But basically in this row, because it makes it easier to search later on, um, anything that's non-zero, instead of uh, scrolling to here, you can also click on this and then just enter the values in here. And you can post information in here on the house. I mean, it's really very flexible. It's it's kind of learner unfriendly, but it's powerful. And then you can paste um, URLs in here, right? Like I can click on this house and bring up, all right, so I can bring up data tree. So this is a data tree entry, right? Or um, realtor.com. So bring up the realtor.com and I can look at the address, right? So all I'm doing here is going through um, Chris's, this is exactly, the due diligence sheets that Chris um, provided. One other interesting thing I've started to do. Um, oh, so this is a fun one. Uh, let me show you this and I'll show you something that's really horrific, but interesting at the same time. So any email. So the beautiful thing is, is any email I get, I can do the following is I can go down here to more. And so this is for 3021 Melrose, and I can say email to list. So if I copy this link, what you saw earlier when I created a group is I copied this and I created it as an email shortcut. So I can append, I send all my emails specifically in this property to this list, right? And then I can make columns to attach to it. But the problem is once I forward these emails, I cannot do a text search summary within the email. But the beautiful thing about ClickUp 
is I can actually send emails because each of these emails is essentially you're creating a task in a list, right? Because if you remember here, th these lists become all tasks, right? But here, what I can do is I can now forward emails as tasks, but in, I always create as a standard template text searchable email summary. So what happens is all the emails I can send directly to this task, and I can do a control F and search all these emails to find, right? But the beautiful thing about this is, let me just show you something, is so this has all your emails that you forwarded for this asset. You basically, in right, some systems, right. you just drop them in, but here you're just actually um, forwarding them and they're just historically here. Right, but the beautiful thing is, like if this contains uh, um, a uh, invoice, mm -hmm. I can enter, I create a column and I mm -hmm. just put the number in, it flags mm -hmm. it as a transaction. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, okay, where did this expense first appear? Bank of America, a credit card. Mm -hmm. And it, is it initially recoverable or finally recoverable? And I can enter a description. So, and so, so with that, I just want to hop in real quick with that. What's important is one of the things with servicers that you always want to check is when they send you payoffs and reinstatements, make sure all your costs that are recoverable are listed there. And what he's basically done in this is it's a simple way where he, once he gets that invoice, he's putting that amount in click up. So I'm guessing he could filter by all those that have costs to it. So he could then, when he gets a payoff or reinstatement from the servicer, open this quickly, click, click on it and cross check. Right. No, that's exactly it. And remember last time when you were talking about, well, do you want to spend your time learning bookkeeping or having Debbie do it? What's powerful about this is I would rather spend my time building this out because what this allows me to do is cross check really quickly with Debbie and see if things are missing. Right. Because mm -hmm. what I can do is I can export this entire view to um, Excel mm -hmm and then download it, and then I can sort by these columns, right? And so it'll show up here, like I can click on this, and um, so you can see like all these columns are there and I can sort and, and whatnot, but um, so, don't say it, come on, um, but, but what I can do also do is total, um, I, can, I can have this add. So you can see this property has just been a nightmare of uh, cost, right? But the good thing is, so one thing I've done start to do here, and this was kind of based on, and I won't take up too much of your time. Um, so one thing I really dislike is arrogance on the part of anybody. And there was one kind of prominent note investor at one of the conferences who was like, oh, I pay the attorneys to tell me what the mechanisms were that triggered could interfere with foreclosure. And don't ask me to send it because it's my IP. But then he told me what the four triggering mechanisms were. And I was like, well, you just told me the idea. That's all I need to know. I can go out and replicate it on my own. So basically what I've started to do here is for each property I have in, in some random areas, like let's say um, Florida County and then city is, you know, statute of limitations, right? And what triggers the statute of limitations? Last payment from demand letter, from complaint, um, from loan maturity, from other. And, you know, what you can do in ClickUp is I can cite the law, I can go into the code and then click on the link that brings me to the actual code. And I can actually capture the text in the long box and do a drop down to, you know, select different things. So um, that's what I'm working on here. And then what I've learned from like Pennsylvania is there's all these other weird things like, okay, what courthouses do you go to to get the information? Are there third party um, kind of uh, tax collectors and that sort of thing? So, so ClickUp is kind of a little bit learner unfriendly, but it's very powerful and you can pretty much do what you want with it. And I don't view any of this as like the nuclear launch codes and 
uh, Chris helped me a lot. So I believe I can actually export templates. Um, so if anybody in this group, you know, I can work with Chris to figure out how to make it um, available, but I believe I can export the templates to other users. Um, how, but, long, how long did it take you to set all this up? Um, so I actually set up the first variant of it. Um, so what happened was Chris got me involved in notes around Thanksgiving and I had a week off at Christmas. So I just kind of treated it like a job and I spent like one week doing it. And um, then I've just been slowly updating it as I go, because what happens is you can save um, templates as you go. So like, let's say I create something and I like it, I can go template center, save as a template. And um, so you just build it out gradually. It doesn't have to be all or, or nothing, right? And I believe, um, I believe you can share templates and, and things like that. And it's really like, once you get the hang of it, it's just so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, so they have something like a dashboard. I haven't played with dashboards too much because I haven't had to, but um, I just created a couple of views here so I can pull up the government. You can do graphs, um, act, active. Oh, and these are tags. So you can create tags to things. Um, you can create a tag summary. And I just I, thought that was a cool look. And I see on your task list, like you can put tasks and know like which ones are overdue or which ones are due by certain yeah. dates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you, have, if you have more than one person in your organization, you can assign tasks to different people. Like mm -hmm. actually, if you go to the Gantt chart on, um, on these spaces, so if I go here, and I go to the Gantt chart. And so actually, I can actually look at the Gantt charts. I can pull the Gantt charts up to the highest level and look at all of them collapsed and then expand them out. But basically, if I go back here and I go to the Gantt charts, which are actually for the most part automatically created, you just have to do the linkages yourself. Mm -hmm. If I pull this capture, asset capture management and make it so one of these tasks goes by uh, an area where it closed, it'll send an email to me and remind me that um, I need to deal with it, so. So how did you learn ClickUp? Was it on YouTube videos or just you use Gantt charts and all this stuff and just kind of played with it to figure it out? Um, uh, I just played um, with it. And mm -hmm. it's like, if you've done any project management before or used a lot of different software packages, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, you know, there are some features and, and there are things that are called um, ClickUp integrations. So you can pull a lot of other software packages to interact like, with this, like mm -hmm. uh, some CRM software. I haven't gotten into that too much, mm -hmm. but you can actually do APIs to bring in like mm -hmm. real-time data, but I wasn't mm -hmm. able to get that to work, so right? I view this a lot. And again, I've seen people who use Podio and have customized Podio. I think it's note rules by, I can't think of the gentleman who created basically his own Podio system uh, for note investors and just replicates it and charges a monthly subscription service uh, for it. But I think it's very similar in the sense of, and what this shows is there's just many different systems you can use and how complex you want it can really go as far as you want to go with certain things. Um, you know, certain people might, you know, you might not need to look at the Gantt chart, but certain other things, um, you know, you know, you can use, it's really up to you on what you want to use with these systems um, from that perspective. And that's one of the things that I talk about um, in a little bit is, you know, it's not a one size fits all um, for what people, um, you know, use and so forth. But so, so for me, like along those lines, I'm a very visual person. So I have a hard time looking at Excel sheets. So for me, I prefer the Gantt chart because I annotate it and I'm like, okay, this is where I am. Um, but other people, if you're like an Excel person, right? You just mm -hmm. create a different view. Yeah. But um, if, if anybody's interested in it or they try it out, you know, I'll be happy to work with you, so. So coming soon is Jeff's one day workshop on how to huh. use ClickUp um, and he will walk you through how he created every single one of these. So 
but now if people are in now if people are interested in that we'll try and figure out a way to um you know convince jeff uh to you know send uh his wife and kids you know away for a weekend and stuff and um send them somewhere nice in the bahamas or something visit family and uh you know jeff can teach click up while they're in the bahamas or something like that so <laughs> ah okay um i'm gonna steal the screen back jeff yeah so sorry if that went too long but it's a little bit um i think you know a lot of people probably found that very interesting because and useful and helpful because again, there's different ways. And again, that software is like 20 bucks a month. So it shows how powerful it can be. Uh, one of the things that, and again, Airtable was something a little similar, but you know, I used to call Airtable uh, Excel on steroids and then ClickUp just brought it up another notch compared to even Airtable. Uh, but no, it just, Again, you can customize things to fit your needs or what you want them to do. Uh, and like he said, you can build it out over time and then adjust it over time is, is you know, based on how you like to manage things. Uh, a few things I would just want to kind of follow up and talk about is uh, as you as you manage just the different things you need to manage, because as you manage a portfolio, you know, there's the asset acquisition due diligence phase. And, you know, from the bidding perspective, you know, you want to manage, you know, getting tapes, reaching out to people, asking for them, tracking your bids. You'd be surprised how many people don't track their bids. Amazing. Uh, and then um, document bid comments. You know, you bid on assets and then you like take all these notes and so forth and on these assets and then you don't hear for a month or three weeks and you get them back and like, oh, which asset was that? Oh, where did I put those notes? Um, you know, you want to make sure everything goes down to being extremely organized and setting up your systems early on and doing that little extra early on, trust me, is going to go a long way. Uh, during the due diligence and closing period, you know, you want to track, you know, okay, order your title, your BPO, the attorney reviews. This is the stuff like a click up or, um, uh, I forgot the, uh, pipe drive, you know, you can go from task to task and move things into the buckets of, okay, I ordered the title. I got the title. Okay. Now I need to send it to the attorney. You know, they can, you can walk you through or automate some of those steps. Um, and then again, you know, as you go to close, you know, review and execute the loan sale agreement, um, you know, get it back. You know, I've had, you know, people basically, um, you know, basically I had to chase people down. Uh, I need to sign loan sale agreement back. You know, it's just because it's, you know, I signed it, you know, you also have to sign it. That's something you want to stay on top of, um, document transfer. Um, you know, the, this process, uh, you know, getting your servicing agreements in place, um, getting everything over to the servicer, push to get it boarded ASAP, um, the digital files, the recording documents, this sucks this. And again, I'll talk about this throughout about the time suck of things. Chasing collateral is the worst part of this business. And I think I got four emails from Sandra over the last two days of things that I've sold to people. It's like, Hey, we need this. You missed this. You missed the DTE form. You missed the SDF form. You missed the, um, Minnesota has got some, you know, random one about septics and wells that you have to fill out, you know, all those other types of forms. Even if you use a company, I sold a loan, Orion had it stored. They had everything out for recording. I sold the loan and said, Hey, ship the collateral. Well, they shipped the collateral and then didn't actually get the documents recorded before shipping the collateral. Like, Oh, we pulled it from getting recorded and shipped it because it was sold. Well, hello, you know, I owned it. I still needed to record it into my name. Um, so, uh, you know, that is probably go ahead, Sandra, you look like you're going to say something. I was just going to say on the previous page, you were saying uh, back up top, you said um, tracking bids. Are you saying um, as you're bidding, keeping track of what's been accepted, what hasn't been accepted, or are you talking about also finding out what it was sold for if you didn't get it? All of the above, but the honestly, above. Yeah. putting in a bid today and then realizing, oh, you know, as you grow, I'll put in bids with, you know, XYZ today, ABC tomorrow, and then a week will come and be like, you'll think, wait a second, what happened to those bids? You know, and then it's like, did I ever get a response? You know, you'll use you some, some scale and you're so busy, be like, Oh, what happened to those bids? You know, and then you need to follow up. And sometimes in person will be like, Oh yeah, I forgot to get back to you, but yeah, are you still interested. And then, or what happens a lot of times is you might not be low. You put the bids in, 
somebody else gets them. I'm sorry, you're not high, not low. You're not the high bidder. Somebody else gets them. They flake because they overbid or something happens, and then it comes back around. That happens a lot more than you think, um, because there's you know a lot of you know there's some groups that will also put bids together and so forth, and you know they may only close like fifty percent of them, so some of them come back around. You know, again, paper stack. I'm not saying anything negative about paper stack, but you see, you know, stuff on paper stack go under agreement and fall back out all the time. Uh, you know, I I don't have the exact number of how many bids that I went to close. Um, actually, I didn't close on, but some sellers, depending on the seller, you know, if you know a seller and they've got hairy collateral or the assets typically a little rougher, you know, and you're going in typically, you know, and you know, okay, I buy their assets all the time. I'm buying them at 35 cents on the dollar. And they come back and say, yeah, somebody's got it at 60 cents. And I joke, I'll say, yeah, I'll see you in two weeks at 35 cents on a dollar because I know that person's not going to close at 60. Um, and sometimes they do, but oftentimes they may not as well. So it's more than, yeah, it's also following up what the bid prices are, but it's actually just making sure that you, you do get a response to those bids. And then on the loans, you know, financial management, important part, of course, the business, you know, pay and code your bills, update your financials monthly, know your cash position, how much money do you have in your bank account, you know, making sure you have enough in your bank account, uh, you know, reporting to investors, if you have investors, uh, eventually, you know, I think most of us probably want to grow to either have enough money on our own where we don't need investors, but before then you probably may need them. Um, the back and forth with bookkeepers, uh, you know, making sure things are coded properly, making you know, from that process, all of this takes time. And at the end, I actually have kind of a graph of like how much time I spend on all roughly on how much time to spend on all this stuff. Uh, organizing collateral, uh, you know, set up your folder system and make sure, you know, if you get collateral, usually it's like one PDF file, take the time to go break it out or have somebody, a third party do that for you. It will save you so much time later on, especially on the non-performing ones. And then you'll realize also, oh, wait a second, I'm missing this document where you thought you may have had it or where is that document? Uh, you know, and set it up in a fashion, um, you know, basically like a servicer does, you know, they have everything outlined and nice and clean and so forth. Um, and the other thing is track where you have it stored. <laughs> you know, you get collateral. I've got, you know, some collateral files, um, you know, sitting on my floor right here that I'm going through that just came in. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'll send them off and then be like, then they'll be like, oh, we didn't get these. And then I'll go through my tracking list with the Bailey letter. I'm like, no, I sent them. Um, but if you use multiple, some people use Casey Wilson and Orion. You know, who has that collateral? Some people store collateral, but then you ship it out to get recorded. Uh, you know, a lot of people used to use Erica Carnegie in the past. Um, you know, and basically you send stuff to her and you're like, oh, did I get that back? Did I not get back that? Where, you know, where is it? And as you grow, you think, oh, I only have five loans. That's not a big deal. When you have 50 loans, where it is? Oh yeah, where is that? Um, you know, so we want to track, you know, where everything is, um, you know, from that perspective and like for ClickUp, that'd be a good column to have, you know, where's the collateral? Is it in-house? Is it at somebody, uh, you know, to track? Okay, my miscellaneous time sucks. And what I mean by this is, you know, what are the stuff that just chews up so much of your time? Uh, you know, chasing documents for recording, um, finding emails. You know, what happened to that email? Typically, I will put in my emails, I will put the loan number, uh, the borrower's name, and the property address. And I had an attorney the other day who I lit up like a Christmas tree because they responded to an email with it was on one loan they responded asking question on another loan and i'm like start a new chain and then basically they didn't and they kept respond replying and what they ended up doing is because it was in a different entity than my other one they sent the demand letter out which they didn't send to me to review under the wrong entity they're like what well, was in this email chain i'm like no that email chain was for you know this property and i told you go under this one and they just confused the two loans uh other things Charges added to the loan, but not being added. I'll get a payoff or reinstatement. And it's like, where is that? And then I have to go back and pull out the invoices, resend them. And basically, I sent it to you on this date. Why wasn't it added? Well, it didn't say recoverable on it. Well, you could have mentioned it to me. It didn't say not recoverable. Um, you know, so, and again, it's, you know, as the 
service are wrong by saying that? No, it would have been nice if they would have said, hey, you know, can you confirm this is recoverable? But then you have to go back and a month later, find that invoice out of, um, hold on, let me just check right now. Give you an idea of how many emails. Can you see my email screen now? Mm -hmm. So in the last, this is from October or November 1, I have 10,000 emails in my sent and 15,000 in my open. So thankfully there's search features, but that gives you an idea of, you know, and that's why I'm an in inbox zero and I'm at 75 today, but you know, and I keep six months of emails in that folder and then I archive the rest, but I can still search. Go ahead, Sandra. Um, how are you tracking your um, charges? Like, are you just keeping the invoices in a folder and that's how you're like, when the, when the services sends you that um, reinstatement, is that what you're comparing it to? I do a bad job at it. So that's the first thing I'll admit. I'll usually put, because I use the mortgage office, Mm -hmm. I will put them in mortgage office and I will run a, I'll look at the reinstatement versus their, or their payoff versus theirs. So you should track them somewhere, whether it's in yeah. Excel or somewhere like Jeff does in ClickUp, you should track them somewhere. Um, unfortunately, I do a bad job at it right now. And that's one of the things that I want to do a much better job at. The other thing you want to track that I mentioned this later on is when a loan gets transferred over, you know, mm -hmm check what the payoff is versus what it was showing in uh, the prior servicer, especially loans that are in and out of bankruptcy or sometimes a negative escrow balance. Some servicers will look at corporate advances and be like, oh, there were 2000 corporate advances, but the, es the escrow was like negative 22,000, which means that the taxes were paid and they just run a negative escrow, but they don't take that negative 22,000 and add it to the charges. So I've had, I forget when I start when I did the MFT fund, I think it was like two or 300,000 in missed charges that got transferred at one point in time. And then the other thing is just keeping track of perhaps legal fees that haven't, we haven't received the invoice. Yeah. Or here's the better one in Pennsylvania, for example, you have legal fees, but they're not recoverable until you file a complaint. So you have to like track that, okay, only $50 is recoverable now, but then it bumps up to a thousand dollars once you file a complaint. So I have no idea. And you know, I'm not going to call on Shante tonight to pick her brain how she does it, but she actually does it, but others may not do it as well um, from that perspective, but I've yelled at Shante enough. To... <laughs> so she, she's got that, uh, that tattoo in her brain on stuff like that. Uh, so again, that adds a lot of time. You know, you spend 10 minutes to go find, you know, one email and I've got 40 something loans in foreclosure, you know, at any given time. Another is, you know, force place insurance or borrower insurance, you know, which, well, where is this? Did it have force place insurance or does it not have force place insurance? Uh, chasing tax bills drives me effing nuts that I'm paying a servicer all this money. And they're like, oh, can you get the tax bill? No, I'm freaking paying you for it. Well, I'm sorry, but we don't do that. Read your contract. Yeah. Fucking no. Um, sorry. Actually, Chris. Huh? Yes. Can you comment on like other services that chase down tax bills, like InfoPro or anything, or doing it manually? I mean, what well, we all know it's a time suck, but mm -hmm. any advice? Yeah. So, first place insurance, I use JB Lloyd. And okay. Again, in my tracking, like in my system, I will put who covers the insurance. Is it the borrower? And when does it expire? If it's a forced place insurance, I have it. I'll put how much is it insured for as well um, on that property. Uh, from that perspective, another key thing to make sure you put whatever you track, what is the property type? You know, because if you, so, you know, because a lot of times people put forced place insurance on a manufactured house and that's not insurable. You know, so you're basically almost like paying insurance and, you know, for something. And again, if it's performing, Great, the borrower's paying, but if it's not performing, you're basically insuring something that's really not insurable. Um, so that's something you want to check. Yeah, for taxes, uh, you know, again, board it with Shante. She does all that for you. But if not, there's companies like, um, uh, was it Ladero is one. Um, InfoPro. Info, yeah, InfoPro is who I use. 
Um, yeah. Oh, Laredo. Laredo is another one. Um, Info Pro is one where they'll track. You send them the uh, tax parcel numbers and they will track the taxes for you. Uh, and basically it's not depends on your size of your portfolio. Um, it's pretty inexpensive insurance policy. Um, the other thing that's beneficial with it is I don't know how many times I have had loans that are performing and on escrow and I'll get delinquent tax bills because the servicer forgot to mail the check. They didn't check if the check had been cashed. Um, so all of a sudden I'll get a delinquent bill and I'll be like, why is there still $2,000 in escrow on this $1,500 tax bill? And um, why wasn't it paid? Um, and the excuse is either, oh, they didn't cash check. Oh, you didn't give me the tax bill or I don't know. And what um, cadence? So you earlier, you said your setup is like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 90 minutes. You, you yep. check, you check loans mm -hmm. um, on, on a weekly, you know, you, you yep. break them in a, each day. And how do you, how do you, how often do you check the taxes? If, if, if it's not, <laughs> sorry, I got a three-year-old yelling at me. Mm -hmm. Um, but how, how do you work that into your daily, your weekly checking thing? Uh, it's, that's a monthly thing. Typically. Okay. That's a monthly. So, yeah. So most loans, most loans I look at once a month in the okay. sense of for global stuff. And then if they're in foreclosure, active stuff going on, they have more of a touch, but most of this stuff is done on a monthly basis. Info pro will tell you when they pull their reports because they don't pull them, you know, they'll pull them like 90 days before taxes are due at that jurisdiction and then send the information to you. But yeah, typically that's, again, morning, I'll look at the assets, lunchtime, I'll go through any hot emails, make some phone calls, you know, I prioritize tasks, and then, you know, my midnight oil is, you know, tasks, get my inbox down to zero. Uh, the other thing that's a time suck is following up with servicers. Like if you're working on a mod, like what's going on, where's the mod? Okay, can we do $2,500 down, 500 bucks a month? And it's like, well, borrower can't do that. Okay, what can the borrower do? Well, they can do a uh, thousand down and 400 a month. And that's like, okay. And then, you know, basically getting the documents prepped, prepared, getting all that information, uh, you know, one-offs again, it takes time, but if you're working on, you know, 10 mods at a time, it's a big time suck. So basically, so I broke down kind of time spent. Um, and again, I just kind of, you know, honestly, just pulled this out of the sky a, a little bit, but I'd say two thirds of my time is on asset management. Um, you know, basically, and the rest is spent on, you know, disposition sourcing, um, you know, disposition is probably 5% sourcing is 5%. Um, disposition is probably 10%. It's much harder to sell an asset than it is to buy or bid on one because you have to get your asset management company. You have to make sure they're, you know, when are they putting on the market? What's the listing look like? You know, they just put, you know, this plain Jane listing and it's like, no, I want to say, you know, potential seller financing or, you know, you know, create some craft to it um, from that perspective. Um, you know, underwriting due diligence about 10%. And then, you know, I put 15% of my time is spent on unproductive stuff. My majority of time is spent on my emails and tasks. Basically, if this was a 40 hour work week, 27 hours is spent on emails and just managing my assets. About four hours a week on financial management, um, three hours a week probably on chasing miscellaneous documents, um, actually two hours chasing documents, I'm three hours chasing things like I'm legal. If you need stuff signed and you need to get a notary, it's like, okay, I got to, you know, run to the UPS store, run to the bank, whatever it may be. Um, you know, probably an hour chasing tax bills and insurance on loans, uh, from that perspective. And then, you know, that's on this here hours per week. And it's the same thing over here, just on the percentage basis. So you actually spend 40 hours a week on your note business? No. <laughs> probably spend okay. more if it was a 40 hour it was more of what yeah. it entails uh i probably actually spend more than 40 you know in one of these slides i joke because i put like weekends are off limits and lately that's you know kind of you know it's actually next slide i think um or no uh we'll get that but no if you spent 40 percent, that's why i would kind of go based off of your percentages you know and i say these percentages for mm -hmm. anyone who has probably 20 or more assets it would probably be, that would be where you're starting to um, really start breaking down a lot of that stuff um, from that perspective of where you're spending a lot of your time.
You know, if you're less, you might be spending more on chasing. And it it varies because all of a sudden, hey, you've got, you know, you sold assets, you got money in the door. Yeah, you're going to spend more time on bidding and so forth. But right before that, you were probably disposing of assets or doing something else. So it's very cyclical. Um, I broke this out over actually a full month's time, not a full week. Um, and then I divided it basically by four, but I did it into like 160 hours because you don't spend, um, you know, basically you know, four hours every week on financial management, I probably spend, you know, two, you know, basically hours paying bills and coding everything a week. And then at the end of the month, I'll spend more time um, making sure the books are done right and everything along those lines. Uh, by the way, anyone know a score to Celtics game? Just out of curiosity. Shante, um, look it up. Thank you. Uh, top 10 things attract. track. Um, I just, you know, was thinking as I rang this down, what are the top things to track? You know, status of the loan boarding. It's important to know where your loans are. Um, you know, I had a loan that's been out there for a while and finally heard something today of what's going on. You know, where's collateral stored? I talked to that. Uh, is a collateral recorded? That's an important feature uh, to understand. Um, and again, because you may think, oh yeah, it is recorded or it wasn't recorded. Um, you know, hold on. Hold on one second. What's that? Yes, I'll be up there in a little bit. You have the remarkable. Okay, I'll be up in a bit. Thanks, buddy. Uh, is the collateral recorded? Uh, like I talked about, payoff matching prior service current servicer, borrower's last pay date. I kind of mentioned that already. Uh, who's carrying insurance on the property? Again, I talked about that. Talked about tax bills, invoice status. Sorry, we basically talked about all this stuff um, already, but I just uh, kind of filled in the blanks since that time. My lessons learned, um, you know, it's part of managing, you're juggling a lot of balls in the air. So make sure that you plan and organize the most critical things. Now, if an attorney needs something signed or executed to continue with the legal process, um, you know, that's cost every, that's a day for day delay. So that's something that, you know, and again, coming from construction background, you know, everything is phased by critical path. You know, what's the thing that's stopping something from happening? Uh, you know, that's a day for day delay. So that's something you want to get executed. Hey, Chris. Uh, yep. I have, I have a question. Um, yep. So in terms of matching the payoff between the previous servicers, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, you know, a month has gone by. Are, are we contacting the prior servicer or how many servicers passed? would you recommend that we go to make sure that that mm -hmm. um, payoff match is, yep. is consistent? So when I'm buying the loan, I usually will ask, hey, can you just run a payoff for me from the seller? But here's the other one that you have to be careful of is, especially if you're buying a bunch of loans, you know, today's April 20th. Let's say you close on those loans today. Those loans, and let's say they're all performing loans. That loan's probably not getting transferred to May 15th. So you also want to make sure that all the payments that came in after the closing date make their way to you. And again, another time suck is you're going to start chasing all those payments. So the way it typically works in most agreements, because this get asked, gets asked a lot, $100,000 UPB uh, and the borrower and you close today. If the borrower made the payment yesterday, and you're paying 80 cents on the dollar. Typically, the new, you pay 80 cents on the new UPB. So let's say the new UPB, let's say they made a $10,000 payment, okay? And 100,000, you're paying 80. The new UPB is 90. You're paying 80 cents on the dollar. You'd be paying 72. So of that 10,000, the seller keeps two and you'd end up getting eight because they're, you know, from that perspective. If it happens after the closing, you get 100% of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you're paying 80 cents on a dollar, you're paying 80% of UPB, the UPB changed a little bit, then you should be paying 80 cents on that. If it's before the cutoff date, that's an important thing in your contract. After the cutoff date, you should get all of it, but you have to go chase all that. Uh, so nothing, if it takes more than 15 minutes, make sure you set the, set the time aside. Don't try and cram or rush things, especially due diligence on assets because you'll make a mistake. 
checking email is a constant distraction. You know, there's a lot of studies out there that say you should only check email like two or three times a day. You know, this is, as you get started, I was famous for this. Like you check your loans like three times a day to see what's going on or servicing notes. And most servicers only touch a loan, you know, one or two times, sometimes three times a week on non-performing. Checking it twice a day is like watching your grass grow. Um, you don't need to watch it that much, but you don't have a lot of loans. So what else are you going to do? You want to feel involved. So you can't check it constantly, um, but you don't need to touch them every day, typically. Uh, you know, set aside a day for week, you know, I call it a potpourri day, you know, which is basically kind of, you have nothing, it's kind of, you know, nothing scheduled. It's kind of like a cleanup day. What am I going to try and, you know, get done, maybe work on something marketing or write a blog post or, you know, something to, to you know, that's just not as part of your typical plan. Uh, make sure you set time for financials, every, you know, you know, I usually do the same day every month or the same day of the month, you know, last Tuesday of the month you know, making sure um, everything goes. I do not pay bills every day. I pay bills uh, typically every Friday um, or every other Friday. So you don't need, you know, again, as you grow, if you're going in the banking system all the time, you know, most pay bills have 30 days, you know, to pay them. So you can pay them, you know, every other Fridays. Typically it depends on the size um, and so forth. But, you know, I just paid my last two weeks. I think I was, you know, venting to Shante. I think I had like 77 invoices that I had to pay. So it was about 50 something thousand. So gulp, um, but a lot of foreclosures going on. Uh, you know, if you do want to scale, it does cost you money, you know, from systems and other processes, um, you know, so it's the, always that fine line of do you spend the money to scale? Uh, but when you do spend it, go ahead, DJ. Hey, one of the things too, to your point about paying invoices, because I, I took that note from you, because um, I used to just pay invoices as they come in as part of my goal to get my inbox down. But one of the things that I found, uh, both in the note business and in the and in my real estate flipping business, starting to pay them all on like one day a week or you know once every two weeks actually helps you a little bit with cash flow management too. Because mm -hmm. I found on the couple performing notes I have, it's like, oh, I got paid, you know some money and that money can just go back out to pay the invoices for my non-performing notes. So um, that's, that's just another tidbit, I guess. Shante, what's the score? It's halftime and my team's losing 65-55. Oh, Celtics down by 10? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, what number nine is important. You know, what works for like, one of anybody may not work for you. You know, your system should be customized, fit your needs, your strengths, your weaknesses. So, you know, depends on the system you use and so forth. But, you know, again, I'm an engineer, so I probably go overboard on everything um, and so forth. But, you know, just try and keep it simple, stupid. You know, that's what KISS stands for. So it doesn't need to be the most robust thing. I am famous for creating that shit crazy stuff that's just so overboard. Uh, poor Shante. I uh, feel bad for her sometimes, but and that is actually all I had. Let's see, what else was I going to show people? If there's anything else I had on my screen, I showed you those. There's my loans. Questions, comments. Yeah, Alicia, you pay everything on the 10th and 15th of the following Monday. Profits first book. Yep. So. Yeah, because I was doing it when they came in, and it felt like I was doing accounting every single damn day. Yeah, and nobody really likes accounting. Let's be honest. No. <laughs> but also, I, and again, if you try and track your time, and again, you got to log into your bank system. Then it's like, oh, two-factor authentication. It's like, boom, go on there, log it in. And then, you know, if you're paying one or two invoices, it's, you're, you know, 80% of the time was getting in the system to pay at one invoice. You might as well use your time wisely and, you know, just try and knock a bunch of them off all off at once. There's another cool tool called Toggle, which allows you to track your track time. Down. And it's used yep. really well for teams, but also if you just want to find out where all your time is going, Mm -hmm. and you're willing to be diligent about tracking it, it's pretty handy. Yep. Yeah, I know people use that for 
um, tracking, like if you're working for somebody, you know, people will use it for people on Upwork and Fiverr will use it too. You know, one of the things too um, that I've learned from being in the note business, I guess, you know, this short amount of time, um, I guess in this, it's not the same as in my day to day on the real estate side, but I used to feel like everything was a fire. You know what I mean? Just because I'm the type of person who likes to respond, like to get on top of stuff. And so, you know, every email I was like, man, I got a response to this today or, or, you know, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And in the note business, it's definitely been an eye opener because people take forever to respond back to you. So it's like I, the pressure is definitely off to be able to respond back. And sometimes a servicer would take, you know, uh, you know, three or four or five days to respond back. Not by five, of course, but other servicers who I've dealt with. What, uh, so what I recommend everyone does is if you have an email that you like send, I will flag that as a follow up to follow up in three days if I don't have a response. Or a certain period of time, you know, just to, because, you know, attorneys right now are overwhelmed because they are short staffed. Um, you know, I've talked to any attorney, they're, you know, paralegal staff and administrative staff who does actually a lot of the stuff, like all your demand letters, all your complaint drafts and all that stuff. Most of that gets drafted by a paralegal, not the actual attorney, because they're all templates. So you don't need a $300 attorney doing it. They have $120 or $100 paralegal doing it, but they're short staffed because, you know, they've lost a lot of people from COVID. So stuff gets backed up or missed or lost. And you definitely, any vendor or whoever you're dealing with, you know, just follow, you know, track things. Don't wait for, you know, some, you know, if, you know, it's like the hot potato. It's like, okay, I sent the response. Now I sent them the hot potato. Don't wait for them to make the next action and be like, oh, a week goes by and be like, well, they haven't responded to me. Um, no, go back after them. You know, send something on Monday, send a Friday. Hey, following up from the email from Monday. You know, just be friendly in your emails. You know, a lot of times I'll ask, hey, I'm just following up. Is there anything else you need from me? Uh, you know, you want to have that tone be not adversarial um, with uh, whoever you're dealing with, but kind of like, especially if you're learning, don't be afraid to say, hey, look, I'm just you know, wondering what the ne next steps are in the process and timing for, for that, you know, what may happen, especially if you're dealing with foreclosures and the complaints filed. Okay, you know, what happens next? Okay, they have to um, serve the, the borrowers, you know, and that probably takes three to four weeks and they have a month to respond once being served. So once I have a complaint get filed, typically I'll, re I'll wait like three weeks and basically like, hey, just curious if the borrower to get served. You know, so I can start the clock on the next one. And certain attorneys are really good. I'll tell you, Satillion Burley is actually really good at all that stuff. They hound you um, a lot of times or keep you in the in the know on a lot of stuff. Um, other attorneys, uh, you sometimes have to just, uh, you know, really chase. One of the things I will tell people that I would honestly say uh, and I, again, see a lot of people posting it online about like starting to reach out and call banks again and so forth. Don't waste your time. Yeah. Don't waste your time calling banks. And why is that? I, I believe you, but just, there's just nothing there or what? Um, typically you're never going to get the person who's actually in charge. And unless you're probably sitting on like. 20 or 50 million dollars which if you are i don't know why you're sitting here on this uh <laughs> webinar tonight, honestly. yeah but um i mean it's very in this i've again i've done that in the past and everything i've gotten from banks was a they want top dollar for it and it was stuff that was awful assets now this again this isn't to say you can't get stuff from banks i'm not saying that what i'm telling you is you're gonna spend you know 100 hours chasing banks to get a tape that, you know, you probably, you, you may buy something, but you know, is the, look at how much time you spent, what's your time worth um, from that perspective. Um, you know, you're much better off building relationships with, um, you know, other people in the space or funds, you know, pick up the phone, call somebody at Condor, which is now, I don't know, gets it, um, pick up call Chaz at Revolve. 
um, you know, call, um, go on paper stack and look at who's selling on paper stack. Most of those people you can figure out and Google who they are, um, as well. Um, and just start building relationships with them. Um, because some of them sell stuff, not on paper stack, like, um, Pike's peak or Pike's capital, whatever it is, you know, they sell stuff off, you know, as well, you know, get the list from Dave Polio and then look up who owns the assignments, you know, from that stuff. Um, so there's lots and lots of different ways just to reach out to, you know, different people who, you know, are actually going to be selling. Perfect. Thank you. Plus, uh, you know, again, I, you know, working in corporate America, I don't know if anyone else does this or I'm just an asshole, but you know, people, you know, again, I get calls all the time for people like, Hey, you know, we're a landscaping company or we're this, we're that. And so forth. You know, we want your business or whatever the case may be. I have people call me like we're in the area and we do custom suits. And I'm like, you know, I don't know if other, but I basically, when I get those phone calls, I'm like, yep, thank you. Um, you know, not interested. Boom. You know, think of, you know, in the emails, a lot of these unsolicited, you know, if I don't know people typically, um, I was actually, I was on the phone today, my phone was blowing up and they called three times in a row and I was getting ready to pick up the phone and scream at him. It was actually my attorney who was in a hearing and needed me on the phone, but, um, cause I didn't show up in caller ID, but you know, it's, you know, when people call unsolicited, are you typically like, cause there's so much spam, spam out there. They're like, Oh, sure. Well, here's another one. Think of the, that bankrupt on the other side, you know? They're probably overworked and underpaid and you're like, yeah, okay. Like I really want to deal with this guy. So, or woman. Like I said, not to say it doesn't happen. I just think your ROI on it is going to be very, very low. Eric's smiling over there. Eric, do you agree with me? 100%. I tried it. I spent a lot of time on it. I um, ended up talking to one guy in Florida who had a non performing matured commercial second that he wanted 95 cents on the dollar for. And, and he was trying to explain to me why that was a great deal. Um, you know, I did talk one time to a um, kind of like a mid-sized bank by me, and they had done some bank acquisitions, and they had a ton of non-performing loans. And, you know, it was kind of an introduction, and I was really excited because it looked like they were interested in doing a sale. And there were a couple calls and then they totally went dark and then would not continue the conversation. And I think it came out that they were under law share restriction on those loans and they couldn't sell them. But the excuse that I ultimately got was that they didn't want to pay someone to go and inventory all of them. So they just, they just sat, they didn't end up doing anything with them. But yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I don't think it's time well spent. I, you know, bankers in my experience, they're very like, they don't want to talk to people uh, in the public realm. They only want to deal with like certain mm -hmm. um, people that they know. And I think a lot of the transactions occur through like the bigger transactions will occur. If they are going to sell publicly, they'll go through like a mountain view because they, yeah. that that adds kind of a, like a layer of safety between them and the ultimate buyer. Yep. Yeah. Most of them will use third, you know, FFN Mountain View or some of the, um, what's the other one like SAI or I forget the other one. Um, mission. They use mission capital. capital yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chris, more general question about if banks are a waste of time, but just more generally, you know, when you're hunting for assets, how do you draw the line or how do you think about I'm putting in a lot of timing and not getting anything? How do you know, you know, in the process of looking for deals, how do you know whether it's a waste of time or not? Yeah, I mean, obviously the clock will tick by and you won't have any good assets, but how do you know you're not, you just haven't hit the right asset yet? You know what I mean? 
because good deals don't just fall in your lap. You got to work for them. Well, you know, you how do you balance the time and, and precision of hunting for good deals? It's more, honestly, it is more about building the relationships with people. Okay. And I would tell anybody all day long, like I could give you a name of, you know, I have a spreadsheet somewhere like 25 different sellers that you could go pull assets from. I would tell you, take the 25 and focus on like three of them and mm -hmm. just, you know, kind of like, you know, having friends, you know, you can have 25 friends, but you'd rather have like three really good friends and kind of, you know, focus on them, you know, see if there's a way you can strike a deal, starting off, just say, Hey, look, first time, you know, kind of like dating, let's, you know, one asset and let's see how it goes. And then if the transaction goes smoothly, then continue to slowly grow your, and that's how I worked with one seller that, you know, basically bought one asset, then bought two assets and bought like four assets. And now basically they throw me deals all the time because I bought probably 200 assets from them. Once you start closing with somebody and mm -hmm. they know you can close the deal, they will, and you're not sometimes the high bidder, but you're close. They will either say, hey, can you come up a little bit, match this, or they will sell it to you if it's somebody they don't know because they're more concerned this other person may not close a deal versus they know you would close a deal. So your reputation is huge. And again, it doesn't happen overnight and doesn't happen in a month's time. It will take a year for a few years, but you know, you constantly just communicate with people. Um you know, certain sellers and really build those relationships over time. I mean, I look at all my notes, I'd say probably 90% of them were bought from like three sellers. Okay. I see Eric you didn't know. said as well. I know Eric's bought a, you know, lots and lots of seconds and I'm guessing you're probably, you know, say very similar. You know what? That has been my experience completely. I mean, I've only bought from maybe ever, I mean, like, like a few or maybe like one here and there, but the vast majority of my purchases have all come from about five sellers. And this is what I've learned. Um, getting bids in quickly, following up, being very communicative along the process, mm -hmm. uh, being extremely flat fast to close. People love that. If you get the deal closed quickly, order what you need, process it then they will kind of, I've, I've found that, you know, right now I'm really only buying from like two entities and they do, that's true. They steer the deals to you because they know that you're going to close it really quickly and they're not going to have to chase you around, you know, for like two weeks, like, Hey, what's the status on this? We want to close this. Mm -hmm. um, I found that that's key speed and communication, but yeah, you really do. I mean, you just see that, I mean, they have stuff over and over. So you just keep buying from them over and over. And it's hard to manage, you know, buying from 20 people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. No. Yeah. It's, um, and it goes in cycles too, because you have a seller that you'll buy a lot from, and then they'll go quiet for a little bit because they're probably in acquisition mode. So they'll go away for six, eight months, but somebody else pops up and is like, ah, Hey, I've got all these deals. And once you start buying from them, they know what you like. So they'll actually do carve outs for you. Basically, like, you know, because let's say now, again, I'll use, let's say that, you know, a tape of first and seconds and Eric does mostly seconds. I do mostly first, you know, they'll be like, okay, we'll carve out the, um, you know, carve out these seconds, let Eric take a look at them. Chris will carve out these non-performing first for you. And then, um, you know, carve out some performing loans for somebody else. Um, cause they'll know, like in some sellers, like when they'll send me performing loans and I'll be like, they, they know, I'm just like, Hey, I won't bid the performing. Cause you know, you, you can find people who might want to buy them at an eight or 9% yield. I'm not going to buy them at that rate. You know, because somebody just will pay and get that nice cash flow. I want, I want 12 plus. So I'll just pull those out and basically then turn around and say, okay, I'll take all the performers, um, you know, our non performers, and you can, you know, break them up that way. Sellers also, you know, if you're going to try and take down a tape of things and there's like one or two assets on there that I'm like, eh, take them down. Because I will tell you every day a seller will want somebody to take down the whole tape, then breaking it up to three or four sellers. So, and then turn around and sell that one or reach an agreement with somebody beforehand. Say, hey, look, I've got this one. Hey, you have any interest in it? Um, you know, and spin that off. But don't turn down a tape because there's an asset on there that, you know, you might be a little, if it's a good deal 
and you have to take it, you know, take the whole thing. I had a tape once. Go ahead, Eric. Oh, I was just going to say another thing that I found is really, that's really important, especially with like, uh, like a mountain view is to be very explicit when you put your bid in on what you're basing it on mm -hmm. and what you still need so that because people get really pissed and they write you off if you try to fade your bid. But if you say like, I'm going to need this pay history, I'm going to need this, this is um, this is an indicative bid. I need the title report back. Mm -hmm. I still need to review this. Please mm -hmm. confirm that you have these documents, that you have the original note. As long as you're really explicit when you place that bid, they don't they don't get upset because you've protected yourself. But if you just send them a bid and then you say, oh, I need now I need this, now I need this, now I need this. No, but I didn't know this. Now I want to pay this price. Mm -hmm. um, people will get mad. Yeah. So in one of the challenges you'll find is, you know, you'll bid on an asset that they'll have a value and you know, it's not worth that value, but if you bid it off of the value you think it is, you're never going to win that deal. So I'll put it in there. I'll be like, I'm bidding based off of your fair market value, but I'm fairly confident this $250,000 house is probably only worth 120,000, um, you know, and then send them a picture <laughs> if I have something. Uh, because it might be in an area that I have three other notes. And basically, if I was sending somebody by, because one of the things I do is every quarter, I typically send a preservation company by, just take photos of every property, do occupancy checks. You know, it's kind of like, is part of, again, that, that's not on this asset management. Um, we didn't get into that type of detail. It was more on the daily side of things. But, you know, if you've got assets in cold weather climates, you know, you know typically I, you know, starting in October, I'll do occupancy checks on every single property and then i'll do another one in the spring you know just send the list to you know export it as a spreadsheet send it to safeguard or you know one of these things and say hey can you do uh photos and occupancy checks on all of them and they cost 15 20 bucks a pop so short money uh from that perspective you know they just go through and then if they're vacant kind of you know wonder what's going on you know get it secured um you know start so again from that perspective you want to kind of know uh, you know, cause you don't need to pipe burst in the winter time up in Northern Michigan. What other questions? Lisa, did that give you a lot of, uh, running room? It did. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. When are you starting to fund? Um, we're planning on having all the paperwork done by the end of June and starting to raise basically nice. Q3. Nice. Congrats. So, thank you. It's a little scary because we made it a lot bigger than I expected. No. I was originally planning. So what's it going to be? Or do you not want to share yet? 100 million. Ooh, that is big. Yeah. So is it you yourself and I or are you? No, dear God, no. Um, <laughs> No, I am. There's two other partners who are all like front facing investor money, raising type people, whereas I'm the back, I'm the back office. Yeah. So they raise the money, you do the actual work. Yeah, exactly. So is it only notes or is it going to be a my myriad of things? Um, right now it's only notes. Um, we haven't quite decided how we want to split it. If we want to do performing and non-performing mix, if we want to do all of one. Um, so the, those are details we haven't fleshed out yet. 506 C. Um, whichever one has to be all accredited. Yeah. Yep. See, see, you I had somebody it. reach out to me yesterday asking if I knew of any note funds, so I can give Excellent. her information. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you. Don't Thank worry, you. April. I don't do any. I was going to say, but yours does some too. So. <laughs> I told her about yours and one other that I knew of. And I said, I don't know if they're open or closed, but I just sent her your info. So. <laughs> DJ, when are you doing your fund? I don't know. I don't, have, I don't have any plans right now. Right now, I'm still using my own fund. So mm -hmm. I'm having fun with much of my own fund. <laughs> but we'll see. I don't know. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the single family, 
residential side, things are popping. We're looking at an apartment complex. We may be taken down. So my hands are full. So I don't want to start another venture without being able to really allocate the time. Um, but it's, uh, it's something I've given thought to. You just don't know when yet. One thing I'd mention, Alicia, is, you know, if your focus is on notes. Try and leave it open-ended, though. That gives you the flexibility to do other stuff. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, the lawyers we talked to was basically like, you know, specify notes and other things subject to general manager, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so basically sure. leaving everything open-ended. Yep. So, so yeah, because if, you know, there's no notes and stuff, but hey, I can go buy an apartment building or what that. It's like, oh, like, you know, it's in the PPM. Nobody can really comment. So, yep. Hey, Chris. Hey. Yep. Hey, Missy. You have, hey, hello. Uh, you had definitely a ton of amazing, not that you, the other weeks have not been amazing, but a lot of amazing content. Would this uh, video be available for us to review at a later date? Yes. So it should be. Um, typically now they get loaded in the weekend on the portal. Um, the the what, members seventy investmentscom if you log in there. Um, which I hope everyone's been able to log in there and see all the documents. If you haven't, let me know. Um, I'm working, I have a CRM, somebody who's going to start assisting us more on the CRM side um, in overall everything. Uh, we have a call with them next Wednesday. One of the things besides just general note stuff is also um, some of the membership stuff of sending stuff out when stuff gets uploaded and keeping, you know, more frequency on, Hey, reminders for when these calls are, um, other types of documents to download and kind of just stuff like that. As you know, I'm not a big proponent of blowing people's emails up because I get plenty of emails, but as things become available, just kind of rehash things. But, um, this, uh, you know, if you want this before the weekend, um, you know, I'll send out, um, uh, once it downloads into my, uh, Zoom and stuff. I'll just send people out the send out the PowerPoint slides as well as a recording out to everyone um, in advance. I'll try and get uploaded to YouTube tomorrow and just send it out. So while well, it's fresh in people's heads. Okay. And related with that, I did see the email about a week or so ago about the affiliate link. And yes. I did try and click the link and I put my information. Um, I, I clicked mm -hmm. the link and it was I was able to get into the site. But yep. then when I entered my email address and click submit, it said this page was not found or something to that effect. Yeah, I've got uh, Robin's my woman who works on that, working on making sure that's um, that's functioning. So, okay. So oh, but if you if you got anyone who's an affiliate, or if you want got anyone who wants to sign up, that you know, just send send them along to me, and I'll uh, make sure that you get the the credit for it. Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Anybody? Bueller? Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing all this stuff. No problem. And thanks, Jeff, for traumatizing me with dog pants again. <laughs> you know you like it. You know you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had to look oh, at a awesome. chart since my W2 job. Give me nightmares tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it was all really great info. I appreciate it. Should you have W2 or no? You left. Me? You, yeah, you left your W2, right? Yeah, it'll be a, a year at the end of May. Mm -hmm. so, cool. Thanks for all the info, Chris. No problem, Andrew. Mike Schultz, anything? Uh, no, just want to say thanks to you guys, and uh, it helps out both in uh, notes and in uh, with my W two job. All the information you guys shared, so appreciate it. Yeah, again, a lot of stuff is not stuff just in notes, just in management, time scheduling, you know, of anything. Just uh, you know, whether it's personal, professional, whatever the case may be. So, but cool. Well, I'm going to go. I have a certain 10 year old who has been running downstairs, looking or peeking around the corner, wondering where I'm going to go join, uh, you know, say good night to him. So, Oh, nobody has anything else. Thank you all. Um, Oh, topics for next week. I can do bankruptcy seeing we didn't do it last week. <laughs> we got sidetracked. So I will put some stuff together for bankruptcy next week for everybody. Cool. Sounds like a plan. 
Thank you all. Have a good evening. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Sure. I'm going to turn this off now. <laughs>